don't think the question is about PPE. Uh, we've leased the warehouse out. I don't think the question is really about leasing. Um, the government has said that there's going to be environmental legislation that requires the owners of property to accept liability for environmental pollution. So we've introduced a policy. We've begun to apply the policy. Now, we've had a report done, and there are chemicals that have contaminated the land. Chemco, presumably, well, I can't sue Chemco. I don't know why, but I can't sue Chemco. And the uh, insurance company won't help me out either. It's virtually certain that the legislation requiring the clean-up of land will be enacted shortly after the year end. Which accounting standard is being tested here, do we think? Provisions, yeah. So, we're looking here at provisions. We're looking here at a uh, potential liability. And in order to uh, recognize a provision, there has to be a um, there has to be a present obligation. There has to be a present obligation, which is legal or constructive, which arises from a past event, where there is a probable outflow of economic benefit, which is capable of reliable measure which is capable of reliable measure. Do we have a present obligation? Is that present obligation legal or is that present obligation constructive? Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. I, I, I'm almost certain you're right. Um, strictly speaking, the law has not been enacted yet. But it is virtually certain that it will be enacted. And maybe that is good enough. That is good enough to say that we have a legal obligation. So we have a present legal obligation. Yeah, because it is virtually certain the legislation will be passed. It is virtually certain the legislation will be passed. Um, now, maybe I should just leave it there, but can I just say that I think there's an alternative answer, which if you articulated, you would get marks for. If you put the law to one side, could you argue that there is a constructive obligation? A constructive obligation is when you've raised a valid expectation. What have you started to do? According to the question, you have introduced a chemical policy. You've introduced a policy. Now, it's not 100% clear to me, but maybe you've introduced that policy and you've announced it to your shareholders already, your stakeholders. Because if you've got a policy which you have already announced, then that announcement raises the valid expectation. And if it raises the valid expectation, it creates the constructive obligation. So, you know, there is an alternative answer here where you go down a different discussion and you go down a different route, but you arrive at the same answer. And that's fine. You know, that's valid. I think you can also argue that there is a present constructive obligation. There is a present constructive obligation if the policy is announced 
if the policy is announced prior to the year end. Because this policy would then, this raises valid expectations. This would then raise valid expectations. So yeah, I think we are going to have to make a provision. Hang on a minute. It's probable we will comply with the law. Do we have a reliable measure? Hmm. It's not mentioned in the question, is it? If there is a reliable measure, then you can debit 10 and credit 10. If there is a reliable measure, the liability will be 10 and the expense will be 10. But if the report says, oh, we're not really sure whether it goes down 6 feet or 60 feet, we're not really sure whether there's one tonne of wastage spilled here or 10 tonnes that we can just pick. You know, if we don't know the cost, we can't do the debit and the credit. So, you know, occasionally you're going to have to just tread a little bit outside the question. Don't go too far outside the question. But in order to make a provision, there has to be a number that is reliable. And no number is mentioned. So it's valid to say, assuming there is a reliable measure, we can make a provision. If there is no reliable measure, what would you then do? Disclose. Yeah, exactly. Disclose. Assuming reliable measure, recognize provision. And expense. If no reliable measure, therefore you disclose as a contingent liability. So, uh, assuming that there is a reliable measure, you would recognize a provision and an expense. Debit PL, credit provision. Debit PL, credit provision. If there's no reliable measure, you would have to disclose it as a contingent liability. Yeah, I'm happy with that idea. I'm happy with that approach. If you yeah, right. That's enough. Yeah, four marks there. That's enough. Uh, let's have a look at D. Let's rattle through D. Yeah, uh, there's more I want to do this afternoon before we go home. And yeah, I don't want to kill you. I want you to be fresh tomorrow. We've got cash flow to do tomorrow. We've got another balance sheet to do tomorrow. We've got some more accounting standards to do tomorrow. Lots to do tomorrow. So I don't want to kill you today. Uh, let's have a look at D. First uh, of December 06, we opened up a school costing 5 million. The useful life of the school is 25 years. Now, in December 12, the school was closed. Why? No children. The school is going to be used as a library. No kids are coming back. So presumably, the only people who will be following the books will be the old people. Thus, the building will not be reopened as a school. The current replacement cost is 2.1 because of the nature of the non-current asset, the value in use, and the net selling prices are unrealistic estimates. The change in use could have no effect on the value of the building. Change in use could have no effect on the life of the building, my mistake. I have an asset, and now decide to use it for something else. I have an asset which cost me five million, has a long life, and after a few years, I am told its replacement cost is only 2.1. What is that saying to you? What is that indicating to you in your mind? Which accounting standard do you think we should be debating in our heads about? What should we be thinking about here? 
I have an asset which I'm putting to an alternative use. I have an asset which seems to be worth less than I originally paid for it. Impairment, I agree with you. I think we are needing to conduct an impairment review because we have some classic indicators of impairment. So, let me cut to the chase. So, we have an impairment review. Yeah, um, the change in use is an indicator of impairment. The change in use is an indicator of impairment. So an asset is impaired when the carrying value exceeds the recoverable amount. And we must recognize the loss. We must recognize the loss. You would recognize the loss in the P&L unless the asset has been revalued. But there's no indication that the asset has been revalued. But if the asset had been revalued, you would recognize the uh, impairment loss in the reserves, other components of equity, until you've exhausted that reserve. Um, there is a depreciation charge that we can come up with. So the asset has a cost of 5 million. It has a useful life of 25 years. So there would have been an annual depreciation charge. There would have been an annual depreciation charge. of 100,000, yeah? An annual depreciation charge of 100,000. So when we are conducting our impairment review, we would have a carrying value where we've got the cost of 5 million, but how old is the asset? Six years, yeah, I think it's six years. Is it six years? Yeah, six years. December 6, November 12 is six years. So six years times 100,000 will be 600,000, is that right? Yeah, and therefore this is 4,400,000. The depreciation is 200 a year. Thank you very much. So the depreciation is 200 a year. So that is 1.2 million. Thank you very much. So the carrying value is 3,800. I do make these deliberate mistakes just to make sure you're still awake. <laughs> so we've got an impairment review. And an asset is impaired when the carrying value exceeds the recoverable amount. I'm slightly disappointed. I'm slightly frustrated. Because I think of the recoverable amount as being the higher of the fair value, less cost to sell, and the value of use. And that's what the standard looks for. But the question is telling us, it appears, that the value in use and net selling price are unrealistic estimates. I don't know why. Surely, a building is a building on some land, and there must be a way of estimating the selling price, level two, So I'm a little bit disappointed by that. It seems strange that we cannot estimate the net selling price. Surely an estate agent would be able to tell you what you could sell it for. So on that basis, we do have what's known as a current cost. Now, current cost accounting is not something that I teach at P2. I never have done. 
Um, I have seen it crop up occasionally though at F7. So maybe if you did F7 recently, you would be aware of current cost. So the replacement cost is 2.1 million, but remember the asset is six years old. So you would deal with 1920 fits. But I don't know. I don't really, I'm not really invested in the process because I don't actually think most of you yeah, would be agreeing with the examiner or doing the same calculation that I'm showing here. And I'm not that bothered either. Yeah, because I think it's weird. Uh, I, I, I should have 200,000 a year for depreciation, so your carrying value is 3.8. Your, re re your recoverable amount should be the fair value, less cost of sale, or the value in use. But this particular question says, oh, you can't work those out, therefore you have to use this method. Well, I question that. But the number is there, so I guess I can use the number. Do I know what the number is? Let me get something which vaguely agrees with the answer at the back. 1596, is that right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And therefore, you get impairment loss of 2204. Thank you very much. 2204. Right. Let's have some more fun games. Let's have some more fun and games. Let's have a look at page one, three, two. Page 133, let's have a look at yellow. Now, I am prepared to help you with this question because this is not a question of, this is not a rough and ready question. This is a very, very specific technical question. Yeah? So in order to answer this question, you can't rely on kind of fleet of foot and inspiration you have to rely on knowing quite in detail some of the story behind financial instruments and in particular, well, you better read the question first because although I'm prepared to help you answer the question, you need to help yourself by reading the question first. Yellow. 